you, Susan. That was beautiful. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Happy Pentecost Sunday to you. The Spirit is alive and well, I hope. Amen. <laughs> and also, happy Memorial Day weekend to everyone. I know most of our families are touched by someone who has served um, or someone who has uh, been lost in service. And our, our prayers go out to those families, and we, we celebrate their service and bravery for um, our freedom and uh, for the rights that we get to appreciate on a, on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, we have a, a lot of announcements to cover, a lot, a lot of good things going on. Um, this coming week, we are sharing, uh, or we are, we are serving at Community Kitchen, a local ministry that, that feeds people and um, serves hundreds of thousands of meals per year. And our missions committee has challenged our church to serve, and uh, I actually signed up for a slot, and I'm looking forward to serving and getting acquainted with Community Kitchen. And uh, thanks to Michelle Bowers for helping schedule these volunteers. And Michelle, as I understand it, we still need two volunteers on Tuesday morning. Okay, so Tuesday morning and Tuesday lunch. I know the morning slot is from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., and the lunch slot is from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., so we need two on Tuesday morning and one on Tuesday afternoon uh, or, or lunchtime. So uh, they would greatly appreciate that and uh, many thanks to those who already stepped up to serve. We extend our sympathy to the family of Fran Bowen. Uh, her funeral was this past Wednesday. Uh, thank you for keeping them in your prayers. Remember the Bible challenge, our New Testament reading uh, this week, Monday through Friday. We're in Acts chapter 17 through 21. And I want everybody to take a look at this page uh, with the blue at the top here. That's a, that's a very important page. Uh, that's our vacation Bible school needs. And uh, we've, we've been asking for a, a few weeks now, and we are still in need for folks to help us serve, uh, you know, vacation Bible school for our children and, and for the children of the community. And, and we still need a lot of help. And I, I pray that the Holy Spirit is prevailing upon our congregation so that we will be able to have vacation Bible school this year. If we don't start stepping up, though, we may have to make some hard decisions. And so I don't, I don't want to even be in that situation. And I'm going to trust that the Spirit's going to move among us to be able to pull this together. And not only to pull it together, but to offer a, a great vacation Bible school. But we need your help. We need you to prayerfully consider serving. We need folks to help us with registration. We need some teachers for our, our pre uh, kindergarten and, and kindergarten classes. We need some shepherds for each of our age groups. We need a recreation leader, uh, a science assistant. We need somebody to help us with story time. So there's, there's lots of needs there, and, and we really need you to step up. Uh, I trust that we will, and I'm looking forward to having another great vacation Bible school. But we need everyone's help. Also, we are looking for assistance or, or, or substitutes to help us with our children's and youth Sunday school classes this summer. The, the needs are listed there. We've had several folks step up, but we need some more uh, for all of the ages, particularly in the youth group. And so uh, Rhonda Singleton's contact information is there. Uh, we, we, we want you to step up so that we can give our regular teachers a break through the summer to, for them to be refreshed. and ready to come back and, and serve as the, as the school year starts. Uh, there's a note in, in here about our patriotic concerts. Uh, I know many of you are, are going to be interested in that. Uh, please note also that we are, are in the process of looking to hire a full-time youth director as well as a full-time children's ministries director. Uh, please be in prayer about that. If you know any good candidates, don't hesitate to share the word with them. They can contact the church office and we can get them the job descriptions and, and other information. So uh, looking forward to uh, increasing our staff and hiring two uh, great additional people to help us with our mission and ministry. Do we have any other announcements we need to cover? All right, let us briefly stand and welcome one another as we pass the peace and love of Christ. And to all you who are joining us online, we wish you God's peace and love as well. Cut my mic off. <laughs>
take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 400. Hymn 400. as we affirm what we believe as written in the Apostles Creed it's printed on the inside of on the outside of your worship steeple this morning I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary son of Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Reverend Dr. Uh, Norman Bennett was not feeling well this morning, so I am filling in for his reading. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment you stretched out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. Hold on, excuse me. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. 
Who looks at the earth and trembles? Who touches the mountains and then and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. These are the words of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving Lord, we come to you on this Pentecost Sunday praising you for your Holy Spirit. Praising you for allowing the Spirit to be with us and in us, to guide us, to strengthen us, to lead us, to comfort us. We would be nothing without you with us. So we thank you, Lord, for your son that came to be with us, his life, death, and resurrection, and the blessing of your Holy Spirit upon your believers. Allow us not just this Pentecost Sunday, but every single moment of every single day Praise you for the blessing of your spirit. And Lord, today we come to you today on this Memorial Day Sunday. 
thanking you for the sacrifice that so many people have made so that we have this wonderful country where we can come and praise you in here and at work and anywhere we want to because we have that ability through what our military did for us. Lord, we lift up the families of those who have lost a loved one through military first responding service. We ask that you bless them with your Holy Spirit. Comfort them as times will be tough without their loved one. We praise you for their service, their willingness to let their loved one go into battle sometimes and hard situations and may have been left all alone to carry on. Lord Jesus, we praise you for the example that you taught us here on earth and continue to teach us through your spirit as we continue to learn through reading your word every single word every single verse every single chapter teaches us how we should live let us absorb that into our minds and our hearts and our lives so that we are your ambassadors ambassadors of peace and love and joy Lord, you bless us with so much. And because of the death of your son on that cross, we have the ability to come straight to you. We are no longer separated from you. His blood paved the way for our relationship with you that our sins would no longer be held against us. So, Lord, at this time, we lift up to you those who are near and dear to us who need your special love and care. Gracious Lord, you hear our every prayer. You hear the ones that are spoken out loud and that you hear the ones that are within our hearts. We ask for your will to be done, that your comfort to be shared, that your peace and grace be available to all. Lord, your son came to teach us so many things, including how to pray. So now we, too, join together and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Over to you. It's time for the children's sermon. So uh, if our, any of our young ones want to join me down front, I would love to meet you down there. <clears throat> Great to be with y'all today. Thanks for coming down and uh, sitting with me for this special little time. Today's the day of Pentecost, and we celebrate Pentecost because that's when we remember that the Holy Spirit came down and filled 
Jesus' disciples. Jesus had already ascended into heaven. He promised them that the Holy Spirit would come. And they were waiting. And they were waiting. And finally, they were all gathered in one place. And do you know what happened? Something really loud happened. Yep, yep, there was flames of fire appeared over their head. But right before that, the whole place was filled with the rushing of a violent wind. So the power of God was, was evident to them in that room. And then those flames of fire appeared over their heads and, and enabled them to speak the praises of God and the good news of Jesus in other languages that they didn't know. And, and the reason they were in Jerusalem was, because, was to celebrate the, the Jewish festival of Pentecost. Sometimes it's called the, the Feast of Weeks. That's a wheat harvest festival. When, uh, when the first fruits of the, the wheat were appearing, God commanded his people to bring him the first fruits as a thank offering for the harvest. And so they were, they were in Jerusalem celebrating that. It was one of three major times they were supposed to go to Jerusalem and, and worship and, and offer God offerings each year. And they were many Jews from all over were, were there to, to celebrate that. And some from very foreign places were hearing these Galileans speaking the praises of God in their native languages that they shouldn't even know. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And after that, the church started growing. They've also named Pentecost the birthday of the church because once the disciples were filled with, po with the power of the Holy Spirit, they went out and shared the good news of Jesus with much boldness and courage and power, even in the face of persecution. Some of them were even put to death. And they still kept sharing the good news of Jesus. And thousands upon thousands of people came to faith in Jesus because of the witness of his disciples who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, can you see the Holy Spirit? Can you see God? Not, not literally, right? You, you, can, you can see the effects of God. You can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. And just like you can't... And sometimes the Holy Spirit has been called God's breath. You can't really see my breath, can you? We can't really see God's breath either, but we can see the effects of it. When I blow my breath into this balloon, when my breath fills this balloon, you can see the evidence of my breath. And, and, and God intends for you and me and all who believe in Jesus to be filled with the Holy Spirit just as my breath filled this balloon. And and, and just like this balloon was kind of kind of lifeless without my breath in it, in terms of, of sharing our faith, we're kind of lifeless without the breath of God, without the Holy Spirit in us. And so God invites us to welcome the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And He comes to live in our hearts whenever we trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. So let, let's pray to God thanking Him for His gift of Jesus and also His gift of the Holy Spirit, His power that can live within us. Dear God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Please help us to trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord for the forgiveness of our sins that we might be filled with your Holy Spirit and your power to share the good news of Jesus with others. Amen. All right. Thank you, boys and girls. Uh, it's time for Children's Church, or, or Little Church, for those that are uh, three years old to first grade, okay? Thank you, Pastor Joel. At this time, we continue to worship God through our tithes and offerings. I invite the ushers to come forward.
gracious and loving Lord, we would be nothing, we would have nothing without you. So at this time, accept these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. May they be used according to your will to love others and to build your kingdom here on earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take our hymn books and turn to hymn 334. Sweet, sweet spirit. <laughs> Please remain standing for our gospel lesson this morning from the gospel of Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. This is the, again the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. We're in a little series right now uh, working through the Beatitudes. We're going to talk about the first Beatitude today. But Jesus, his ministry has taken off. He's called some of his disciples to follow him. He's done some powerful teaching. He's healed some people. And already some great crowds are starting to gather to listen to him. And Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount by announcing a series of eight blessings. And uh, we're going to continue talking over these blessings over the next few weeks. We're not necessarily going in order because we wanted to pick certain ones for certain Sundays, particularly blessed are the poor in spirit for today. So Matthew 5, verses 1 through 3. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began to speak and taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Friends, this is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Please be seated. So Jesus looks at his disciples in this crowd of people who have gathered on this great occasion near a mountain, and he announces to them, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What, what in the world does Jesus mean by blessed are the poor in spirit? It's, it's a good question to ponder, and, and theologians have debated on, on what Jesus really means here. But most basically, poor in something means that you don't have much of something, right? Poor in something means means you lack something. The, the Greek word that, that is used here is, is tochos, which describes absolute or abject poverty. Jesus is talking about a person who has nothing at all in terms of the Spirit. He's saying, blessed are those who are absolutely destitute of spirits. You know, and many have, have interpreted this to say that the poor in spirit means that you recognize your poverty before Almighty God. And that's a healthy thing to do. When we recognize our poverty, we recognize our need. And that's a healthy place to be before Almighty God. Preacher Colin Smith says that Jesus is describing what a person feels when he or she realizes who God truly is. Think about it. Standing before God's majesty, God's power, God's holiness, we realize that we are utterly bankrupt compared to who God is. We get a glimpse of this uh, in the prophet Isaiah's life when 
he saw the vision of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. The, six, the Lord is sitting on his throne. He's high and lifted up. He's exalted. The hem of his robe fills the temple. Seraphs were in attendance and they chanted and sang to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the pivots on the, threshold, uh, on the thresholds of the temple shook. Just at the sound of the seraph's voice, the attendance of God. And Isaiah cries, Woe is me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah got a glimpse of who God is, and immediately he was humbled. Immediately his sin was painfully evident to him. Compared to the holiness of Almighty God. Isaiah became poor in spirit in this moment. Have you become poor in spirit before God? Maybe, maybe your experience wasn't as dramatic or as vivid as Isaiah's vision. But have you had a time when you experienced God's presence closely? When you were completely convinced of God's existence and when you were overwhelmed with God's power and God's glory and his righteousness, but also his mercy and love. I'm not talking about just an emotional experience. I'm talking about a realization of, of who God is and it, and it brings an overwhelming sense of, of gratitude and humility. <clears throat> Why is this important? Because it's then that we realize that God is absolutely everything that we need. We are completely in need of His grace, His forgiveness, if we're going to have any hope at all. It reminds me of a song that I learned when I was in high school going to Christian retreats. It was, I think it's called My Only Hope Is You. My Only Hope Is You, Jesus. My Only Hope Is You. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. And then it goes, my only joy is you, Jesus. My only peace is you, Jesus. And the last verse says, all that I need is you, Jesus. All that I need is you. From early in the morning till late at night, all that I need is is you. When we're poor in spirit, when we become when we get to a place where we are poor in spirit, we we recognize that. That our hope comes from Jesus, our joy comes from Jesus, our peace comes only from Jesus. All that we need. He is my he he, he in another song just came to mind, he is my all in all. All that we need is Jesus. And when we, when we come to an understanding of how good and holy and wonderful God is, our, our pride melts away. Our, 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 our selfishness is, is refined. Our priorities move from our own personal preferences to God's purposes. Because we realize that in those instances that God is completely good and that God can satisfy, fully satisfy everything that we lack. What would it take for you to put yourself into a position to see, to, to truly see who God is in his majesty, in his power, in his righteousness? And I don't think that we can live in a perpetual state of, of what Isaiah experienced. I think those, those could be referred to as a, as a mountaintop experience. You know, those are acute times of, of awareness and of an acknowledgement, you know, of, of, of who God is. You know, even, even the disciples, when, when they witnessed Jesus' transfiguration, they, 
and they were overwhelmed, Peter, James, and John were, and they, they wanted that moment to last, and they offered to build three shelters, one for Jesus, one for Moses and, and Elijah, to make that moment last, and probably out of respect for them too. But Jesus says no, and, and eventually they had to go back down the mountain, back down into the realities of life, back, back to the, the daily grind, to the, the, the routine and, and the work of life. Maybe we're not meant to, 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 to have these mountaintop experiences perpetually. But I think we can have them more, more often than when we do. Because I think oftentimes our, our human nature gets in the way, our, our human weaknesses and limits. We, we have temptations and distractions. There are times when we forget God. There are times when we simply rebel against God. And choose what we want over what God wants. And of course, that, that quenches the spirit, that quenches these moments and their, their power in our lives. And I believe that's why it's so important for us to, to make time in our lives on a daily basis for refocusing and recentering on who God is. We need to make time, devote time regularly to think about God and to reflect on His majesty and His glory. We need to devote time to consider that the God of the universe created us in His image and wants a personal relationship with each of us. We need to devote time to reflect on God's holiness and His righteousness and to think about what God wants us to do. And when our minds are, are properly devoted to God, again, all of our personal preferences begin to fade away. All the thought about my rights and my liberty, they begin to pale because that's less important than who God is. All the thoughts about expressing our personal identity those fade and give way to God's identity. We can so easily let ourself rise to the forefront and forget to put God on his throne where Isaiah saw him high and lifted up with the, the, the foundations of the place shaking. Those moments can come in our, our lives when we continually fill ourselves with thoughts about God and, 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 and verses about God. We need to remember the fact that God's wrath and God's judgment are real. And it is only by the grace of Jesus that we won't face them. We need to think about the reality of what Jesus went through when he allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be shed as, as he was nailed to the cross for you and for me, for our sin. Sometimes we don't realize how much we need God until we realize what God has done for us. And when we acknowledge our need for God, it begins to make room in our hearts and minds for His Spirit. I believe that's getting at the essence of what being poor in spirit means. Paul writes in, in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, talking about living in the Spirit or, or, or living for ourselves, living in the flesh. For those who live according to the flesh, have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on things of the Spirit. You know, in flesh, he's talking about worldly influence, you know, our human depravity, our, our, our human wickedness. And he says, to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And for this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are of the flesh 
cannot please God. But you, talking about you who believe in Christ, you who are, who are wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but you are not in the flesh if you are in Christ, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit, listen to this, if the Spirit of Him, <coughs> excuse me, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. We don't owe ourselves a thing, Paul is saying. We are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Do we want life? Or do we want it our way? Do we want all of God's fullness or would we rather have it our way? When, when the Israelites were, were coming into the, the promised land, God, I believe, had, had Moses stand before the people and, and, and he presented them the covenant, the law, the way God wanted them to live. And he stood before the people and he says, I, I present to you blessings or curses. Choose life. Choose my way. Don't, don't, don't be tempted to go your own way. Don't, don't, be, don't be tempted to pursue your own desires. Choose my way. That's what God is commanding His people. That's the posture that we're supposed to take as the people of God. Preacher Colin Smith says, if, if you want to move beyond a vague religious belief in which God lives somewhere in the distance, if you want a felt awareness of God's presence in your life, remember, God dwells in the person who is poor in spirit. God dwells in the person who is emptying his or herself. To, there, there might be room for his spirit. I want to close with um, three, three ways that being poor in spirit will impact our lives. Number one, uh, people who are poor in spirit, they give up the idea that God owes them. People who are, in, who are poor in spirit give up the idea that God owes them. You know, as God's creatures, we have a duty to Him, but it's so easily, especially in our American culture, you know, to forget this and, 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 and slide into the idea that, that God is the one who has a duty to us. We're prone to forget and we fall into the thinking that God exists to serve us, to answer our prayers, rather than the fact that we are God's servants. You know, one of the opposites of, of being poor in spirit is pride. Pride says, I gave God something, now He owes me something. Pride always leads to disappointment, bitterness, and resentment. Pride kills God's blessings. One quote I read this week says that pride can only live in the person whose heart is far from God. And that's why Jesus may be saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Number two, those who are poor in spirit pray earnestly. Those who are poor in spirit pray earnestly. You know, people who know of their need have an active prayer life. I, I pray so hard when... 
when I need something, you know. But when we're poor in spirit, we, we realize that, that God has everything to offer us, and we're not bashful to ask. You know, Jesus told a story about two men who prayed. One, a Pharisee, known for his strict religious observance. The other, a tax collector, who was known for his corruption and sin. Both of them prayed, and yet there was one vast difference between their prayers. The, prayer, the Pharisee prayed about himself. Lord, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast and I tithe. You know, when we look at his prayer, the striking thing about his prayer is that he comes to God and never asks for a thing. He's simply informing God of, of, of how good he's lived. He's miles away from being poor in spirit. He has no need to ask, or, or feels he has no need to ask. However, the tax collector stood at a difference. He didn't even lift his eyes up towards heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, this man and not the other went home blessed, justified, at peace with God. He was the one who was poor in spirit. Number one, people who are poor in spirit give up the idea that God owes them something. Number two, those who are poor in spirit pray earnestly. And number three, people who are poor in spirit are in a position to receive. People who are poor in spirit are in a position to receive. Many people come to the Lord with their hands full. I've had my hands full plenty of times. And we have to struggle with that. Our hands can be full of, of all sorts of things from, from possessions that we treasure too much. Goals or ambitions that we set at a priority above God. You know, sometimes our hands are full with temptations or, or habitual sins that, that we don't want to let go of. Other times we're full of ourselves, we're full of our own pride. Impressed with ourselves so much that we forget we need God. But as long as our hands are full, we're not in a position to receive. Thomas Merton said, you can't receive gold if your hand is full of pebbles. Isn't that a powerful quote? You can't receive gold if your hand is full of pebbles. So let go of those things that are of the flesh. Let go of those things that are of this world. Let go of the influences of this world that you might be able to grasp hold of God and everything that is right and everything that we need and everything that is good for us. Jesus is inviting us to humble ourselves, to become poor in spirit, letting go of the things that we think we need so that God can give us what we truly need. Colin Smith says you can't cling to the cross of Jesus if your hands are full. Only those who come to God empty-handed, aware of their own need, can cling to the cross. And the great hymn, Rock of Ages, says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Wash me, Savior, or I die. The poor in spirit are completely dependent upon God. Let's learn the value of being poor in spirit. It's going to be something that we have to work at and, and, and maintain that posture. But it can be done. And God can bless us and fill us with what we truly need to accomplish his purposes. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we're going to sing from the faith we sing, the little black book, number 2236, Gather Us In. Let's stand and sing together.
you didn't remember anything else today, remember this. God is the one who has, <laughs> and we are the ones who need. And to remember Thomas Merton's quote, you can't receive gold if your hand is full of pebbles. You can't receive what you need from God if your hand is full, if your heart is full, if your mind is full of something else. Let's go and ponder these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.